Hello, world. It's great to be back with you. And my name is Katha Cato, and I am the executive director of the Queen's World Film Festival. Preston Cato is somewhere around here, but it is submission season, and so he is watching films. So I'm flying solo tonight with uh, Deadline AV, and that gives me a lot of confidence. So it is with pride and confidence that I welcome you to a very hopeful broadcast, which is part of the listening tour, which is a program of the Queen's World Film Festival. So we've been gathering small groups of people together uh, and to ask them questions about hope and resilience. And there are 12 short videos that are finished. There are 11 more in the pipeline. And eventually all of them are going to be living in the Queen's Memory Project, which is a project of the Queen's Library. And we're very excited to be creating these conversations and this dialogue so that future researchers, future generation can know who we were and, and how we continue to thrive and how important maybe the arts are to everyone. Um, so this is what we call a listening stop, and we have invited three guests to join me. So without any more delay, I would like to welcome Montaigne Masek, Dora Naughton, and Anu Stapa. Hey, Katha. Is everybody here? Hello. Hey. Hello, everybody. It's hey, good to see hi. you. Hi. Good to see you. Hello. Okay, Montaigne, I hear you. Yes? Yes. Thanks for having us. All right, great. Um, so I thought we would start, because this is a unique group, um, I thought we would start with each one of you just kind of telling your history, introduce yourself and tell your history with the festival. And so let's start with Anu's. Okay, my history with the festival. So I got in touch with Queen's World Film Festival in 2017 because I was working on a capstone, which was a documentary about a hate crime. And, you know, so somebody suggested, suggested me to submit my film at Queen's World Film Festival, then I submitted it and then it got screened. So that's how I got in touch with Queen's World Film Festival. After two years, I was like, you know, I was invited by Ketha to take care of communication and social media. And then the bonding grew larger and larger and larger. And right now I'm the board, happy, honorable board member of Queen's World Film Festival. <laughs> that's me. That's, that's very exciting. And it was choose somebody else to, to tell us about themselves. Okay, uh, on my right, Montaigne. All right, my name is Montaigne Logic Masak, also known as Mr. M. Um, I'm a two-time Queens World Film Festival alumni. Uh, I joined Queens World Film Festival in 2012 for the first time, then again in 2017. And last year in 2021, I actually volunteered. And now I'm currently on the board of directors, and I'm happy to um, and Dora, I'd like to hear a little bit about you. Well, thank you. My name is Dora Naughton, and I am also an alumni of the festival. I produced a short film in 2017 uh, with a very good friend of mine named Scott T. Henson, who wrote and directed the film. And in 2018, we had a very healthy festival season. And in 2019, we were in the Queens World Film Festival. And I got involved because I started going to the events, the social events through the festival, and I just fell in love with the message and the community. And I thought, I like to say, th these are my people. And I started volunteering as a festival associate. I was doing a lot of the event planning for CAFA in 2020 when the world blew up and we ended up going virtual. Um, then the following year, I did another full-on festival associate year. It was great. It was so fun to be at the actual screenings, and I didn't get a chance to do that the time before. And now I am also on the board of directors. Very happy to be here. And thank you, all three. And, you know, I, uh, I'm i constantly going through my emails and cleaning them out, and I used to put you, emails from you into a folder for the year that you had screened with us. And now I'm putting your emails into the board of director file. And it just makes me really happy when I do that. It just, it's really, it's really important to us. And it's great to have you with us. So thank you for giving of your time and coming to the listening tour. So how this is going to work. I'm going to ask the first question. I'll call on the first person and they'll speak. And then when you're done, you're going to call the next person and we'll just work through our list of four questions. So I'm going to start with the first question. Everybody ready? Do you feel, do you feel it? All right. So it, it's really exciting to be here actually to, to be listening. So the first question is how do you define hope? 
And I'm going to ask Dora to start. Oh boy. Well, I define hope in two ways. I see it as fuel. It's fuel to the fire because it's very easy to feel hopeless at times. And especially now, you know, like with the horrible hate crimes that happened over the weekend and in general, like there's always something going on that's really hard for people. And I feel like hope is the thing that helps us enact change. Like you don't like how something is, but you can see, you can see it in the distance. You can capture the big picture. That's the other way that I try and define hope. I see it as the way to, oh, how did I put it? Um, to put it, I will, I try to emphasize, emphasis on, or I, emphasis on trying. Um, I feel like I have to remember that the unknown is just as likely or even more likely to come out as okay than not. And you just have to keep that in mind. And that's how I define hope. And Montaigne, take it away. Um, I would define hope. Uh, well, to me, hope is synonymous with faith. And I believe faith and or hope is what uh, enables us to will things into existence, right? Things that, you know, maybe only you can see, um, maybe things only you hope for. And, uh, and with that being said, I also uh, relate hope to vision. Right. Have a vision, not uh, not in the physical, but, you know, have an imagination, have a vision, having foresight uh, uh, as to what you want to come. Right. So once again, willing things into existence. What about your news? What do you think of uh, hope? So for me, hope is an, an optimist, uh, optimistic state of mind where you are, you know, expecting for some positive outcome and uh, uh, especially during this time uh, post COVID like there, I have like made so many friends who are having a, a, a kind of a depression and but still they are hopeful because they think that the sun will rise again, you know, that's the way nature works. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a state of mind which actually keeps us going so that we we know that something good will come and you know, it, it it keeps us moving. I guess hope always keeps us moving, even though even though we go through a lot in our life. Even I'm going through a lot in my life. Everyone is going through a lot in our, in their life, but still, hope is the only thing that binds them and you know pushes them to move forward. That's what hope means to me. Thank you. Okay, next question: How do you define resilience? And I'm going to start with. Montaigne. Um, to me, resilience is survival. Uh, to be resilient is to survive anything that life throws at you. And um, I hate to be short, but really, that's that's what it means for for me to simply just survive whatever's being thrown at you, and and actually not just survive, but thrive, no matter what life is throwing at you. Um, Dora, what about you? 100% agree. And in fact, that's pretty much what I said. I, in fact, I would go as far as to say it's an evolutionary trait that we've developed. I don't see how our species would survive without resilience. And of course, it wavers, you know, like sometimes you really can't take it, you know, like you really can't. And that's okay. It's not a value judgment. But I feel like resilience is an innate trait, you know, to move forward and to persevere. You know, otherwise, what else do you have? And it is definitely about survival. The news, what do you think? Yeah, I actually think the same way that Dora and Monta, you guys are thinking. Yeah, resilience, resilience or resilient means for me, like recovering quickly from a difficult you know, conditions. And I think you know, hope, being hopeful is part of being a resilient, being resilient. And yeah, that's, I think being resilient makes person patience, patient, and being resilient, you know, makes people, um, I guess they, it makes people encouraged to do so many stuff because you're always like, you're always hopeful to, 
have something good happen in your life. And resilience is one of the key factors which you know keeps you moving. Otherwise, you'll just be a downer. You just be sad, and you, nobody wants to be sad. And to not not to be sad, you have to be resilient and hope for the best. I think that's what resilience means to me. Okay, next question number three: Who's the most resilient person that you know? And Anus, we're going right back to you. I think the most resilient person that I know is my mom because um, uh, I I discovered about her resilience right now when my baby was born. I I she has a, a good political career back in uh, in my country Nepal, and she now has the guts to you know take care of her grandson at the same time, but. I knew, when she came here in the US and like she was helping us take care of the baby, she was just juggling her political ambition in her country and then, you know, uh, taking care of our her grandson at the same time. And I was really fascinated to see that side of my mom because I have always seen her as a mom. But now I saw her, I see her as a grandmom at the same time. And I see her like she doesn't want to she doesn't want to, uh, you know, let go of her political ambition, political career, and she doesn't want to let go of her being a grandmom. So she's resilient to move forward, and she's she's really patient in handling both things at the same time. So for me, my mom, Montan. Um, it's it's almost a little unfair of a question because I know so many uh, resilient people in my immediate family and or my um, friends, right? Um, I mean, I want to say my mother, I want to say my aunts, they, they've came from Haiti to America young and still, you know, carved out a path for themselves and, and that's successful, and, you know, was able to be a positive influence on me, et cetera. Um, but however, the first person that came to my mind is a friend that I went to college with, who's no longer with us, who was also an actor, he was pursuing acting in L.A., when he, at the time of his, uh, at the time he passed, uh, his name was Theodore Future Jones, and uh, he 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 renamed himself Theodorable, <laughs> Theodorable. And if you see him, <laughs> you and, and knew his spirit, you'll know why that's even more you know funny. It's funny just the concept of it, but he's he's like he was um he was a a bright spirit, but if you look at him, you would just think he was just a stone cold killer, right? He had this big scar on his face. He was this big brawlit guy, and um, but he was just like a, a a lovable person. But when I met him, we started an organization in college together called Street Smart Movement, and um, the concept of that organization was to pave a way and create a network for people coming from backgrounds like ours. And at the time when I met him, he did not want to be involved with any organization. He didn't want to have too many friends because his past. Uh, relationships with people led him to more trouble. He had a, a background of uh, incarceration and et cetera. And um, he, he, had, he fought several bouts with homelessness. And um, even when he went to LA to be an actor and um, it was just so happy the creator would move me to California at that same time. So I was able to witness him, you know, uh, find his way out of homelessness and poverty and into the acting world. And um, I just know so much about him that I can't say right now, but that guy was the probably one of the strongest people I ever had the pleasure of knowing and stay positive the whole time. And that is not easy to find in people, people that stay positive while going through trials and tribulations. So I want to dedicate this moment to my guy, the adorable Future Jones. And Dora. Well, cheers to the adorable. That's awesome. Um, for me, again, for me, it's, yeah, how many people do I know, you know, and I do have to say my mom is incredibly resilient. She's one of these people that has survived things that are unimaginable, and she managed to break the cycle of negativity in her life when she met my dad, and they both had similar, you know, survivor things and it was something that they wanted to do they wanted to start a family to break a cycle and and it worked you know they had a very happy marriage and my dad passed away and I saw my mom grieve and yeah that was really difficult 
And I'd have to say she's tied right now with my father-in-law, who currently lives in Kiev with his wife, who's Ukrainian. And um, they feel like the lucky ones right now because Kiev has been, for the most part, spared over the last month. And that's resilience talking, right? Because at any given time, no matter what, they are in harm's way. Like there's just no denying that. And yet the man keeps us updated. He goes out and goes shopping during the day with his wife and they take care of each other and they take care of their neighborhood and their community and their friends. And it's just, it's, it, it beggars belief, you know? And, and, and we get a lot of gallows humor. I won't go into specifics. <laughs> But we get a lot of the kind of defense mechanism I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, and anyway, he's just one of these people that just will always press on. He went back to Kiev after being at his other house elsewhere in a different country, even knowing this could happen. Like, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just blown away by that. So props to my father-in-law, big time. Those are pretty moving stories. Thank you, guys, really, seriously. Um, I promised myself I wouldn't speak until the end, but it's just such an honor just to sit here and provide time and space and not be in a rush, and not be checking my emails, and just, like, listening. I feel like we're defying this divide that we have right now, and I just thank you so much. So our last question is, um, what do you hope for and whoever let's go uh dora let's let's start back with you oh boy can i say world peace <laughs> <laughs> like right now like that feel, i feel like there's a um that our fates are intertwined with all the different cultures and religions and backgrounds and socioeconomic situations that people are in I feel like there has to be a way for these things to, to connect, that people will finally be so tired of fighting that they will, you know, allow their governments to do the right thing or, you know, pick the people that will do the right thing. And in the United States in particular right now, I feel that we're at a very critical period when it comes to that. And that would be my hope, that we wipe out white supremacy, that we wipe out racism, that we wipe out, wipe out homophobia, transphobia, everything. And that even though there are people who have values that you have to respect because it's a different culture, it's a different life. You know, like I, I don't want to be ethnocentric about this, but I feel like there has to be a happy medium that we as humans can find and that can empower people, basically like the equity that is needed to empower people. That's what I hope for. Oh, logic, give it to us. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot I was supposed to pass it on. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna agree with Dora and then I'm going to add on that. Uh, it, may, it may sound a little uh, personal, but it's really not. I just hope that um, my personal uh, business and creative initiatives uh, leave a positive impact on generations to come, um, starting with my home, starting with my son, and um, create a willing the children he would you know bring into this world. Um, so I, I just really hope to leave a, a, a lasting impact with my work, not necessarily. Uh, it doesn't have to be me, my name, and or legacy, but just the work that I'm involved in creating and bringing to life and the businesses that I would uh, leave here. Because, you know, cor corporations live longer than us. They, unless you resolve them, they'll stay around. So I'm hoping that to be part of, um, you know, legacy uh, corporations and um, creative initiatives and projects that really impact generations to come. And I just want to add that um, I want to thank the Queens World Film Festival um, for uh, bringing us together as board of directors. Um, it's not easy being resilient. And um, 
sometimes we can uh, uh, not lose hope, but we can get discouraged. So it's really, uh, it's really a pleasure to be seen, right? So I, I know that um, you wouldn't have asked us to be on this board if you didn't see us for who we were. So I, for one, I feel privileged to be seen for who I am, which is a, a businessman with, you know, a heart for philanthropy, youth advocacy, and community empowerment. And uh, a news on you. So what do I hope for the future? Uh, I think I think I want to go, go, go to the past, go to the history. Uh, meaning I want to go back to the pre-pandemic time where everybody was meeting everyone. You know, there, there was a feeling of touch. Like I, I really miss feeling the, that touch with people. And I don't want to do listening to like this. I want to do listening to in a room, you know, like, like where I can, you know, pat on Montana, where I can, you know, pat on Dora. I can, you know, even like, you know, shake he head with Katha. I want to go back to that time zone. So I want to go back to that, to the past. So that's what I mean. So, but uh, hopeful uh, for the future, uh, meaning uh, since I, I hope everyone gets vaccinated so that we go back to normal and yeah, uh, and I hope the, the conflict that we are seeing in Europe and, you know, Asia and the Middle East, they get solved soon so that everyone can have a good time and live in peace. Like what Dora said, like we want to live a peaceful life and, you know, die in a peaceful way and say, okay, the world where I was born in is, is at peace, is, is in a good hands. So yeah, I hope uh, nice things in the future. <laughs> uh, I hear a very hopeful voice behind you and I saw a little hopeful face. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank you, the three, for, uh, of what you've said and you put yourselves out there uh, and trusted us to listen. I appreciate that. We have just a few minutes left. I would love to hear um, what you're up to, maybe share some announcements, what you're working on, uh, those kinds of things. That's hopeful. And I think that I'm speaking to three very resilient people. So, um, Dora, what's going on? What are you working on? What's happening? Uh, well, I do have um, an idea for a play reading uh, to raise funds for pro-choice causes. I, it's a very lofty goal, um, and I'm going to work on it and see what I can pull off. And in the long run, uh, Jean and I, were, my husband and I, were supposed to go to, to Kiev and Ukraine this summer. Um, but what we have planned is as soon as we can, you know, once the war ends, which it will end, we're going to go and volunteer. That's, that's, that's crazy. That's our crazy. plan. Yeah. Um, I don't even know what to say to that. Like, I wish you could go and just hang out. Yeah. You know. I so want to be sipping an Aperol Spritz in Mariupol right now. And I can't because it's gone. Well, they better get ready because you're going to clean that place up. I can, I can tell you that for sure. We're going to try. We're going to try. Montaigne, what's going on? What are you working on? Um, well, due to the pandemic and you know, the whole COVID thing, uh, I had to close my studio I had in Brooklyn, um, where recently I just partnered with somebody to reopen the studio in, in Far Rockaway, Queens. So um, I'm... I'm my, my uh, energy is in getting that studio uh, active as the one I had in Brooklyn pre-COVID. And um, during the pandemic, the two years of the pandemic, um, a lot of my productions that were going on in the studio that became virtual, um, that looked like me producing a lot of talk shows and podcasts and uh, even some music video mix shows and game shows virtually, so um, right now I'm just sitting on like thousands of hours of content that I virtually produced um, during the pandemic. And I look forward to remastering, if you will, a lot of that content to uh, come out under my netcast network, as well as produce films on some of those uh, individuals. So one would be a podcast that I produce for a young lady who was almost murdered by her ex-boyfriend um, but she survived it. She, she was resilient. 
um, stabbed 13 times, went paralyzed from the neck down, went from that to walking, talking again, and having a child and creating her own nonprofit for victims of domestic violence and or abuse. And that name of that organization and podcast that we were producing is Silence Kills. So now we are turning that initiative into a short documentary and hopefully that it will turn into a documentary series, right? That will be picked up by an even bigger platform than I could provide. So what about you, Anus? What's going on in your world? Oh, uh, same like you, Monson. I'm also working on my podcast. <laughs> so uh, we we had finished uh, the first season of our podcast at the end of the day, uh, back in 2020 when pandemic was in its peak. So we we interviewed almost like 110 people in the span of more than two years. And we took a break because we had a baby. And we are, so I'm hoping to launch the second season of our podcast. And, and the good thing is our, our nonprofit is willing to partner with us uh, to produce content. So that means like, you know, the passion project will now make some money, hopefully, <laughs> because of their partnership. So I'm actually working on that. I hope we uh, we would launch that uh, second season at the end of the year. And the podcast is all about like helping newly arriving immigrants, professional immigrants in this US to navigate their career because it's a new, different world for them. It was a new world for me as well because I'm originated from Nepal and I came here in 2014. It was a new world and there was so many things I, I didn't know until I, you know, hit road bumps. So I hope like uh, the new uh you know professional uh, immigrants who come here they don't have to go through that so that's the uh, whole premise of that podcast and my second project which i'm which i have been working since the past three years is also documented like uh, like you mountain i'm not like copying you anything but i'm actually doing, working on a documentary so it's, it's a documentary of, uh, the theme of the documentary is centered around like how like many people um, die, you know, waiting for organ transplant, especially in, in the US. So it's a story about a Nepali woman who got a lo double lung transplant and uh, she survived everything. But unfortunately, three years ago, she passed away. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, sad news is she passed away, but but not so good news, but uh, their, their her parents want to tell that story with everyone and, I have interviewed everyone and, you know, did some research, shot everything, filmed everything. And I just need to sit down with the, hus uh, with the husband. And then, yeah, I, I think I'm going to, you know, produce that documentary maybe at the end of this year or maybe the start of the next year. So let's see what happens. But uh, post-production, it takes a lot of time, as Montaigne <laughs> obviously knows, because tons of footage is. But I hope to tell that story because uh, in that way, uh, as her Father says that, you know, this is how we, uh, her daughter will, you know, live forever with that documentary. So I hope to produce that documentary soon. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm kind of pinching myself because like, I know very full people who are working on documents. These are films and these are plays, but these are documents that, that will outlive us. And I think that they re reflect, what you're working on reflects the important issues of now. And um, it's important. And you guys are, you are the, the fire carriers and you are vital. You are filmmakers, you are artists, you are family members and you're so vital to us. And I'm so appreciative of knowing you and having you guys on the board. And I'm excited to see what we come up with next with everybody, I want everybody to be safe, okay? Drink lots of water. Right, it helps almost <laughs> everything. Okay, yeah. so we're, we're going to wrap up this listening tour, and I just thank everybody so much. And uh, please keep an eye on Queens World Film Festival. We're heavily engaged in the community, and we'd love to bring the listening tour to wherever you are and hear what you have to say. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deadline AV, and they're going to sign us out.